Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. Welcome to Concord Matters this week. Uh, I'm your host, Pastor Joshua Shear, Senior Pastor at Our Savior Lutheran Church here in Cheyenne, Wyoming, coming to you from uh, beautiful, sunny Wyoming today. So uh, glad to uh, glad to be with you for this hour as we go through the book of Concord. That is what Lutherans believe, teach, and confess. Uh, we're using, uh, for Concord Matters, as we always do, the Concordia Reader's Edition from Concordia Publishing House. You can go on cph.org, find a copy for 20 to 30 bucks, uh, yeah, the, it, there's no there's no doubt about it. It's one of the greatest bargains out there. Um, one of the best books you can read outside of Scripture. And so uh, this is just a faithful witness of what Scripture teaches, and that's why we Lutherans ad- hold to it. And that's why we make vows to, uh, as pastors, to have our whole ministry conducted in accordance with these Lutheran confessions because they are uh, what Scripture teaches. And so... Uh, yeah, this is a great thing. That's the great benefit of this show as we go through the Book of Concord, uh, just paragraph by paragraph, people listening in, learning, uh, asking questions, and so forth. Uh, if you do have questions today, uh, you can call us on 314-821-0850 or 1-800-730-2727. All right, my two guests today as we start into the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Pastor Mike Grevy, uh, who's a regular guest with me uh, here on Concord Matters through Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Golden, Illinois. Pastor Grevy, good to have you with us again. Pastor Shearer, thanks for having me on again. Awesome. And then we have, uh, he's been on before, but it's been a quite a while, Pastor David Ramirez of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Union Grove, Wisconsin. Pastor Ramirez, good to have you on. Yeah, good to, have, good to be on. Nice to talk All to you right. again. Excellent. So we are in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. That is the defense of what the Augsburg Confession teaches over and against the criticisms of the Roman Catholic Church and theologians of the time. So we're in Article 12, which they divide up into an A and a B. So we're in 12B or 12A on the section on repentance. In particular, we're going to be starting at paragraph 28 this uh, today. And so we're going to be talking about the subheading here, the two parts of repentance. So I'll start us out here by reading uh, paragraphs 28 and 29. Uh, If you've got this at home, read along with. Good stuff, heavenly treasure. All right, paragraph 28 and 29. To deliver godly consciences from these mazes of the learned persons, we have attributed these two parts to repentance, contrition and faith. If anyone desires to add a third fruit worthy of repentance, that is, a change of the entire life and character for the better. We will not oppose it. We separate from contrition those useless and endless discussions regarding grief from loving God and from fearing punishment. We say that contrition is the true terror of conscience, which feels that God is angry with sin and grieves that it has sinned. This contrition takes place when sins are condemned by God's word. The sum of the preaching of the gospel is this, to convict of sin, to offer for Christ's sake the forgiveness of sins and righteousness, the Holy Spirit, and eternal life, and that as reborn people we should do good works. All right, so here we have it as we start out with these two parts of repentance, contrition and faith, and then it has mention of this third part, possibly the fruit of uh, good works are so fruit worthy of repentance. Pastor Grieve, you want to start us out by just explaining some of this, the two parts of, of repentance. Uh, we, it's right from the Augsburg Confession, really, is, is what we confess. So, Pastor Grieve, if you would. Yes, well, the, um, the two parts of repentance um, always must go together. They're mixed, contrition and faith. And as it, as it says there, contrition is the sorrow over sin, uh, as it is condemned by God's Word. Uh, but that alone is not enough. It's not enough to be sorry for one's sins. The sorrow over one's sins does not merit the forgiveness of sins. 
uh, faith must be added to it and mixed with uh, the contrition uh, for it to truly be repentance. And this is not a uh, repentance is not manufactured by uh, the human spirit. It's not something that we can uh, work up inside of ourselves. It's not we can't be uh, sorry enough for our sins. Uh, that is to say, so, the sorrow is not a matter of degree. It's simply um, a matter of truth, uh, the reality that we are declared guilty by God's word of sins. Um, so it is a terror of the conscience uh, when it hears that it has offended God. And so the faith uh, then needs to be mixed with that in order for it truly to be repentance. And that third part that you briefly mentioned uh, the fruit of good works, the, the simply the 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 new life that continues to grow and make progress in good works. Uh, it's not stagnant uh, or anything like that. It does continue to make progress in in sanctification and in good works toward the neighbor. Excellent. So this is, I mean, this is what the scriptures teach: uh, sorrow for sin, uh, terrors of conscience, so to speak. But then, of course, faith. That is, you know, God forgives sins for Christ's sake. And then, of course, what does that do to the person? But it gives them, uh, a, you know, fruit worthy of repentance, as, as, as John the Baptist preached, as Jesus preaches, Paul preaches, and so forth, uh, as, as faithful preachers do. Uh, they, they talk about fruit of repentance, and that's a good thing. So you have this Roman Catholic distinction here, the loving God and fearing punishment um, useless and endless discussions. And so uh, we'll, we'll probably just leave it with what the confessions say there and, and say that such discussions trying to make a difference between uh, loving God or fearing punishment are, are best left uh, outside, whereas we can just stay with contrition being terrors of conscience. And then, of course, faith in, in the gospel added to that then is repentance. Now, this takes place when sins are condemned by God's word. And then it says this gospel. Okay, the sum of the preaching of the gospel is this. Pastor Ramirez, we, we talk about this in, in sometimes in, in our theological stuff about, you know, the gospel in the narrow sense that is kind of a very strict definition of the gospel. And then we have a, a more uh, kind of wider sense for the gospel. Uh, would you explain that a little bit about this gospel being used here to kind of show condemned by God's word and then they use the word gospel? Oh, I'm I'm understanding that uh, Pastor Ramirez is having some difficulties hearing t uh, over the over the line today. So if uh, if Stephanie on the board would take a look at that, Pastor Grevy, did you hear what I asked uh, Pastor Ramirez? This idea that you know gospel in the wide sense versus narrow sense. Um, can you explain that just a little bit to us? Sure. So the gospel in the wide sense. All right, Pastor Grevy can't hear us anymore either. We're having technical problems. So I'll answer my own question. Uh, gospel in the wide sense includes the preaching of the law. So when you hear sometimes Jesus say, you know, preaching of repentance and forgiveness of sins, he's also saying there, preach the gospel. But that includes the preaching of the law at times. Now, when we go into narrow sense, that's the gospel as far as Article 4 of the Augsburg Confession, that we are justified solely by faith for Christ's sake when we believe uh, that, that for Christ's sake we are forgiven because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. That's the gospel in the narrow sense, which explains... God's work only, not our work, but always talks about what God has done and so forth. So, all right. So, Pastor Ramirez, uh, are you back with us? I, I can hear you better now, yes. Excellent. All right. Pastor Grevy, are you with us? Yes, I am here. Yes. All right. So, I could I just hear you answered earlier. The I, about... I think maybe it was you who couldn't hear me that last time. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we covered gospel in the wide sense and the narrow sense. Let's move on to paragraphs 30 and 31 here as we go through this uh, all apology of the Augsburg Confession. So Christ includes the sum of the gospel when he says repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. That is Luke 24. Scripture speaks about these terrors from Psalm 38. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. And then from Psalm 6, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul is also greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? And then finally from Isaiah 38, I said in the middle of my days I must depart. 
I am consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. I calmed myself until morning. Like a lion, he breaks all my bones. All right, Pastor Ramirez, it might be a little bit odd to hear these passages of Scripture because, of course, we like to think of God as, as, as always kind of this, the, the nice thing. And, and, you know, so hearing him talk about breaking bones and being troubled and crushed and so forth by God. Um, so can you explain some of this? Why? What's this about? Well, this is about God's wrath against sin. And, you know, this is one of the most clearest doctrines in the scriptures that God truly hates sin. And sometimes people, I believe, are taken aback by putting the word hate and God in the same sentence. But he does. God is holy, and he's just, and he rightly hates sin. And actually, uh, though, though we understand ourselves to be sinners and our consciences are rightfully terrified, knowing that God also loves us and that he has sent his son to pay for our sins and to save us from our own unrighteousness and our wickedness, it's actually very comforting that God, as Christians we can see it as comforting, that is to say, that God hates sin and that he will totally separate uh, good from evil and darkness from light. And that's a wonderfully comforting thing. So yes, it, it is uh, frightening and rightfully scary, as it should be. I mean, we are to fear, love, and trust in God above all things, and we should fear his wrath. But at the same time, it's also a wonderful thing to know that our God is truly holy, that he will not tolerate um, sin or wickedness uh, in, in, in heaven and in the life uh, of the world to come. And that's wonderful. Uh, we can know and be confident that he is going to totally and utterly uh, purge us from, uh, purge all sin uh, from us and forgive all sin. So I, I think that while the wrath of God is something that we, we need to emphasize and it can rightfully be scary, it's also a wonderful thing because God is going to deal with sin. He has dealt with sin and he's going to totally separate us from it. Well, this is, this is the promise of vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, correct? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that there is a time when, when those who have who have been you know been opposed to the gospel, opposed to Christ, and thus opposed to His Church, opposed to Christians, uh, that yeah, you know, we would pray that they'd repent and and be forgiven as we are, but in the same respect, understand that there is a time when Christ returns, and for those who do not believe, that is a time of God's vengeance being repaid upon them. Right, absolutely, and. Uh... I guess I would, I would just add in that I, I'm, I'm particularly focusing in on how even within us, even within us Christians, he, God is not satisfied just to say, okay, you are a, a sinner, but that's okay, don't worry about it. No, he's going to actually uh, totally forgive us and totally purge that sin um, out of us. Of course, uh, ultimately and finally that's done uh, in death, but... Um, uh, but, of course, it's done through the, the merits and the work and the atoning sacrifice of Christ. But that's what's so wonderful. Not only is he going to put all of our enemies under his feet, like you said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, but also he loves us so much that he's not satisfied to leave us wallowing in our sin or to have any sin or darkness clinging to us. He's going to totally and utterly purge us, and that is um, out of his love, but also out of his, out of his holiness. Yeah. Sometimes the confessions use the language of mortification here, that, that the Holy Spirit works mortification within us, that uh, killing off of the old self, the, the selfish self, the sinful nature, and its, right. its rotten fruit. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's great that way. Um, let's move on to paragraph 32, because it explains just kind of what we're talking about here. In these terrors, conscience feels God's wrath against sin. This is unknown to secure people living according to the flesh. The conscience sees the corruption of sin and seriously grieves that it has sinned. Meanwhile, it also runs away from God's dreadful anger. Human nature, unless sustained by God's word, cannot endure his anger. All right, we'll, we'll pause right there. Um, Pastor Grievy, this is unknown to secure people living according to the flesh. Can you explain that a little bit, and especially then explain how that might interact with the Christian. 
Yeah, there's a um, uh, a place where Paul talks about the spirit warring against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And um, he is making, uh, one of the points that he's making there, among others, is that um, the flesh wants to do, quite simply, the things that it wants to do. <laughs> and because it does, uh, it the flesh... Uh, in a sense, breeds its own security. And um, security that is in the flesh will ultimately only does lead to death. It, it, and it is darkness and, and so forth. And it, and it is separation from God. Um, but the conscience, when it is, when the conscience is functioning properly and hearing God's word, it will recognize God's wrath against sin from his word, which is, which is unknown, as the confessors say here, unknown to secure people living according to their flesh. Now, we all, as Christians, must struggle against the flesh, but we can only do that by the Holy Spirit. We cannot struggle against the flesh by the flesh itself, because the, the flesh itself is, is what, what is precisely the problem. So... Uh, the conscience, as the confessors say here, sees the corruption of sin. And the reason that the conscience sees that is because the Holy Spirit is pointing it out to the conscience from the Word of God. Uh, and so unless we're sustained by that, unless our conscience is ultimately bound to the Word of God, there is, uh, it, it will only be bound to something else. And if it's bound to something other than the Word of God, it will ultimately uh, be bound to the flesh. Excellent. Not the word. Yeah, this is this is interesting because it points out, of course, the conscience is going to see the corruption of sin. That is, you know, original sin, but then also seriously grieve that it has sinned, which is then, of course, the distinction of actual sin. That is the fruit of original sin. So that the conscience that the Holy Spirit would awaken and inform is a conscience that understands the the the, the, the corruption of the sinful nature by original sin. And that that is actually sin, but then also the fruit of that original sin, which which are the actual sins we kind of recognize more often in our lives. Absolutely, and, and God wants to do that, but He wants to do that by His Word. Also, He wants to uh, reveal that uh, to us, so that we would not be condemned according to the flesh, but rather so that we would be um, uh, saved according to the Spirit. Exactly. And then, of course, this beautiful statement, human nature, unless sustained by God's word, cannot endure his anger, which is exactly what you were talking about, Pastor Grevy, that, that the human nature is, is frail and weak and opposed to God. And, of course, if it's not going to be sustained by God through his word, then it won't stand a chance. Because, of course, what is a creature compared to God? Uh, it won't stand a chance. Exactly. So this is right. what we have. All right, let's, let's look at paragraphs 33 and 34 here. St. Paul says, For through the law I died to the law. Galatians 2. For the law only accuses and terrifies consciences. In these terrors our adversaries say nothing about faith. They present only the word that convicts of sin. When this is taught alone, it is the doctrine of the law, not of the gospel. By these griefs and terrors they say people merit grace as long as they love God. But how will people love God in true terrors when they feel God's horrible wrath, which is beyond words? What besides despair do these people teach, who during these terrors show forth only the law? Pastor Ramirez, this is obviously talking yeah. about how the law works on people, how it functions, its uses, and so forth. You might see here a little difference, because we, we talk about how the law always accuses, but here we actually have the phrase, the law only accuses and terrifies consciences. Can you explain this a little further for the listeners? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that just like in all things, uh, uh, we, we talk like this when we talk about interpreting the scriptures, and you know we, we understand that the scriptures interpret the scriptures, and so, too, just uh, with, with any type of document or words that we're interpreting, we should look at the context in which they're being used. And here, uh, when, when the statement is said, for the law only accuses and terrifies consciences, we shouldn't take that phrase and divorce it from the point of this, of this passage in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. The, the, the context is obviously 
uh, talking about uh, hum- you know, human nature, human flesh, uh, the conscience that, uh, that cannot handle uh, the truth about God, and, uh, or all the way back in 32, uh, you know, the conscience feels God's wrath against sin. Um, this is unknown to secure people living according to the flesh. Um, so we're, we're talking about people who are, who are being uh, confronted with their sin, and then later in, in paragraph 34, we're also uh, we're, we're seeing Philip Melanchthon, the author, talking about how uh, his, his opponents are not teaching this properly, that, that if the law alone is taught, then how in the world can consciences be comforted? And that is the truth. If we don't have the gospel, if the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord um, and his death, his resurrection, his suffering on our behalf, and his fulfillment of the law in our stead and in our place, if that isn't taught, then the law is going to ultimately only accuse and terrify us. That's, that's true. This isn't, though, some sort of abstract statement that the law of God only ever, in all circumstances, and in all places, and in all times with all people, only accuses. Um, because, of course, what is the... What is the law of God? Well, it's the eternal will of God. It, is, it describes how he's ordered the universe. It's what he says is right, what he says is wrong. And that obviously communicates information, so the law teaches. We know, uh, as we talk as Lutherans, about the three uses or functions of the law. Um, you know, it's a curb. It curbs men's outward bursts of, outward bursts of sins. It accuses and terrifies consciences, but it... In that way, it drives us to repentance and faith and to the reception of the gospel. But also, as Christians, we who have been blessed by the Holy Spirit to be called, gathered, and enlightened by the Holy Spirit, um, and be brought to faith through the preaching of the gospel, we now look at the law and we say, yes, this is God's good will and His word to us of who we are and how we are supposed to live. So, yeah, I mean, this is not a comprehensive uh, sentence about everything that the law does in all times and all circumstances. But, yes, to those consciences that are only hearing uh, the law without the gospel, uh, then the law can only be something that terrifies their conscience, that only accuses them. Because without the gospel, then, then we have no hope. So in that context, I think we can understand what, what the phrase means. Excellent. Thank you. And then it does, it goes on to talk about this error of the, the Roman Catholic theologians who, who say nothing about faith. Pastor Grevy, in, in, your, in your care of souls in your parish, that is the, the members that God has entrusted to your care uh, by sending you to serve them, uh, what would happen if, if you just went in there with only this doctrine of the law? What, what would that look like? It would uh, look um, like death. Quite frankly, it would it would uh, look like death and darkness and gloom and doom, and uh, hellfire uh, coming down, and and that would be it. And it would really rob uh, consciences of comfort, and it would rob uh, the heart and soul uh, of the needed and and necessary. Uh, medicine of of God's grace through Jesus and the atonement for all sins that he accomplished when he sacrificed himself as the pleasing sacrifice to his Father in heaven uh, and for our sake. Uh, so that would, uh, that would be a most grievous error on the part of any pastor, including myself, if just go in there with the law and nothing else and leave it without uh, the gospel that well, the shame uh, would be on me for doing that so it's that's why we always have to have law and gospel uh, you know as pastor ramirez has has alluded to you have to have both uh, never just one or the other um, it, it's it's in in some ways i mean and of course these the distinction is very important between law and gospel obviously but it, in some ways, it's 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 mixture of law and gospel in a similar sense to what we're talking about a mixture of contrition and faith for repentance. I mean, the and the, and yet there are important distinctions there. So 
Um, but uh, yeah, in short, it would be it would just be uh, death to only preach the law. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I mean, so so what you might see in a parish where this happens is you would see probably people trying harder uh, to to do the law themselves, and then you would either see them despairing from this and and having no hope whatsoever. Or you would see them finding false comfort, uh, deceiving themselves into thinking that they're actually achieving something. And, and, and you see this, uh, they, they speak about this in Roman Catholic theolo theology, obviously, for the apology, but you see this in, in kind of evangelicalism, uh, in American evangelicalism, this stress upon the law and, and doing and, and so forth, to the point to the exclusion of the gospel. And, and ultimately, to the if they try to include gospel, it's a perverted gospel of works. And uh, they never get to the narrow sense of the gospel, that, that, that there is forgiveness in Christ. And so you see this happen, and you see these people fall into these great and shameful errors, like either, like I said, despair, which is where a lot of evangelicals are, and then they leave the church and so forth. And then you also see them oftentimes become proud and, and arrogant and, and haughty about how uh, they are Christians, and look at them. They are doing everything. And, of course, the preachers in these churches are horrible. They're just doing life advice and practical sermons and so forth, um, which is which is not the gospel. No, and sadly, would, we see this even fit into right. some of our own mist. Um, certain yeah. preachers want to mimic and, and, and pretend like they're like the greatest evangelical preachers, but all they are is, is dispensers of the law. Right. And they forget now, about the say, forgiveness might, of sins. Uh, add, just to add one thing there, and I... Yeah. If if somebody we got, we got is, about a minute. Is, okay. If somebody is uh, secure in their sins, uh, you know that is when the law is needed uh, in its full severity. Uh, if someone is, um, you know, uh, a secure sinner who has no worries over their sins, is comfortable in their sin, uh, you know, it goes back to that phrase you know, un, this is unknown to secure people living according to the flesh. If that's the case, then then the law needs to crush that, and that does need to, that does need to come about. But uh, generally, uh, for the most part, our people, you know, need to hear both because they are uh, terrified in their conscience because of their sins, and they do have contrition, and they want, and they want and need uh, the, the absolution and the gospel that help that takes away that guilt absolutely all right so you've been listening to concord matters on kfu am radio the messenger of the good news we just finished talking about contrition that is godly sorrow for sins we'll take up at the other at the bottom half of the hour we'll take up repentance that is faith in christ the second part of repentance uh stay tuned you're listening to concord matters on kfu kfuo Concord Matters is a show seeking agreement in Christian confession. I'm Pastor Charles Henriksen, one of the hosts of Concord Matters, heard on Worldwide KFUO each Tuesday at 2 p.m. Central and a repeat on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. Central. We take an in-depth look at the Book of Concord with some fine Lutheran theologians. Concord Matters, live on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. on Worldwide KFUO, the messenger of good news. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. Each weekday, the servants of God at the LCMS International Center gather together to receive the gifts of God in His Word. I invite you to join us weekdays, 10 a.m., for a live broadcast of daily chapel services on KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. A gift to Lutheran Education School Association gives students the opportunity to receive an education of academic excellence that prepares them as leaders of tomorrow in mind, body, and soul. If you would like to support Lutheran Education, consider attending a Night for Kids tribute dinner auction on Saturday, April 7th. Proceeds benefit over 9,000 students enrolled in 35 Lutheran schools in our community. For information, call 314-200-0797 or visit lesastl.org. 
KFUO is faithful to the Word of God. Listen daily to KFUO as we focus on salvation through Christ Jesus. Generations have heard KFUO proclaim the good news through our talk programs, music programs, and worship services. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. KFUO, faithful, scriptural, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. We are the messenger of good news, KFUO. The Thompson Bible, a first in the history of Bible publishing in America. Jane Aiken took over the family publishing business when her father died in 1802, leaving her with a sizable debt. A debt incurred in her father's failed business venture with his brother-in-law to make printing of the first English Bible printed in America financially successful, the 1782 Aiken Bible. Despite professional limitations for women, Jane became an accomplished printer. But accomplishment didn't pay the bills. Jane never recovered from her father's debt, even spending time in jail. Yet her greatest accomplishment was the Thompson Bible of 1808, the complete Old and New Testaments translated by then former Secretary of Congress, Charles Thompson. The first complete Bible ever printed in America by a woman. Engage with the Bible in the history surrounding this book of all books. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. Welcome back to Concord Matters here on KFUO, the messenger of good news. Uh, you're listening to Concord Matters. I'm your host this week, Pastor Joshua Shear, Senior Pastor, Our Savior Lutheran Church here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Joined with two other pastors, Pastor Mike Grevy of Holy Cross in Golden, Illinois, and Pastor David Ramirez of St. Paul Lutheran in Union Grove, Wisconsin. Uh, we've been going through the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 12, and they divided up into A and B, so we're in A. And then we've been doing paragraphs uh, 28 and following. We just wrapped up before the break of paragraphs 33 and 34 which spoke of the Roman Catholic error of, of omitting faith and omitting the gospel, really, from uh, their care of souls. And, Pastor Ramirez, uh, you wanted to respond with something that we didn't have time to talk about before the break. Yeah, I, I just wanted to offer, uh, or actually, I, I wanted to uh, turn the tables and ask you a question. <laughs> that's okay. Ah, I suppose that's okay. <laughs> um, or I, I'm sure it's just a... Uh, a clarification, because I, I know we would agree on this. We we uh, we subscribe to the same uh, confessions, and uh, but my so, uh, Pastor Shear, you were saying that how would this look in a parish if if there is not the preaching of the gospel, and and you and you pointed out two ways this would go wrong, and and I thought that was a great thing when you said, you know, either people would be constantly wondering if they were good enough, they had no security, they would only be terrified by the law, or uh, conversely, because the law was doable. I don't know if you actually said that, but that seemed like what you were getting at, that the law right. kind of deceived was, into was, thinking that they can keep the law. Right, thinking that they could keep the law, that they would get very self-satisfied or uh, puffed up in their own works because they thought that they could fulfill the law in, in some way for, for, for holiness before God. Um, but you, you started out that wonderful distinction or, you know, those two paths, those two bad paths, by saying a parish that people work really hard to do the law. And I guess I, I want to push back just a little bit um, sure. or clarify maybe, because I'm sure uh, we're, we're on the same page on this. But I, I think that it'd be great for a parish, and it is great when a parish is, is like this, and people are working hard to do the law. But right. as long as they understand they're not doing the law for salvation, but they're doing it for their neighbor, that they're doing it in freedom. They're doing it knowing that Christ has totally fulfilled it and everything has been paid for. And because of that, I mean, that's the only way you can do a good work, because, um, yes. you know, because, you, because you know that you're not doing it for salvation, but you're doing it in response to God's love and not for salvation. So I guess I, guess I just wanted to push a little bit back at you and say, hey, I would love for every parish in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod to look like busy bees of people doing the law. <laughs> I think that'd be yeah. awesome. So. No, what, what you're saying is great. Um, so, so, of course, my intention was, of course, following the Roman Catholic model of omitting right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, the gospel, I, I, and it produces these kind of self-centered uh, workers instead of those who actually are producing good works, which is works done in faith. 
uh, according to the law. Um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, what, you, what you're hearing, though, is, is this is great because listeners can hear this. So when we're discussing theology, one of the great things to do is sometimes ask these follow-up questions. And, and when you're discussing with your pastor or with other Christians, ask these follow-up questions. Clarify. Uh, you know what? We're, we're, we're confessing the faith here, so we want to be precise. We want to make right things. And so when an imprecise thing is spoken, uh, it's good to ask clarification to find out, no, no, actually, you know, you don't want a bunch of people, whoever, who, who, however, in a congregation who don't think works are important that are just like, you know, well, you know, whatever, we don't need to worry about that. No, you, you're right, Pastor Ramirez, and that you want people properly instructed in law and gospel, believing in Christ, and from that, wanting to love God and their neighbor and being active in, in works, uh, and, and the works that God has given us to do, that is the commandments, and especially in relation to vocation. Right. Uh, the, the, in the states of the home, the church, and, and, the, and the civic realm, uh, you have works to do. Well, and, so and isn't that, and I, th I think that might be Melanchthon's point, going back to paragraph 28, when he says, if anyone desires to add a third, fruit worthy of repentance, that is a change of the entire life and character for the better. We will not oppose it. I mean, he's right. making, I think, obviously, the proper distinction to say, yeah, that's fruit, that's, that's good works that flow from faith, let's let's keep that in its proper place but you know that is what's going to come and uh, yeah that well that's what that's what peter says you know make a practice of doing these virtuous things right you know uh th that this is good because of course we acknowledge this is coming from god at work in us and we cooperate right. yes that's good and so we're gonna we're gonna get to that here um so let's move into let's move into the uh, paragraph thirty five and thirty six and so forth. Uh, we're going to talk about the second part of repentance now, which is we kind of started leading into it by talking about faith. So, paragraphs thirty five and thirty six. Here they are. As the second part of repentance, we add faith in Christ, the gospel in which the forgiveness of sins is freely promised concerning Christ, should be presented to consciences in these terrors. They should believe that for Christ's sake their sins are freely forgiven. This faith cheers, sustains, and enlivens the contrite, according to Romans 5.1. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. This faith obtains the forgiveness of sins. It justifies before God, as the same passage testifies, since we have been justified by faith. This faith shows the distinction between the contrition of Judas and Peter, of Saul and David. The contrition of Judas or Saul is useless because faith is not added. Faith grasps the forgiveness of sins given as a gift for Christ's sake, so the contrition of David or Peter helps because faith, which takes hold of the forgiveness of sins granted for Christ's sake, is added to it. All right, so here you have paragraphs 35 and 36, the second part of repentance. Um, and this is just, just beautiful because it's, again, confessing the central article of the Christian faith, that is, justification by faith in Christ. Uh, Pastor Grevy, if you would just give a uh, comment, a little uh, ex just explanation for those who are listening on further about this. We add faith in Christ, the gospel. And here we're talking narrow sense. Sure, yeah, right. This is the, yeah, this is the gospel in the narrow sense. So this is the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus for sinners. And it's the full atonement, complete, universal atonement of all sin on the cross. And the faith that receives that work, um, that's the faith that is added to contrition here. Because it's this faith that then cheers the conscience, comforts the conscience, removes the guilt from the conscience, uh, takes it away. Uh, we do have peace with God since we are justified, have been justified, and are justified by faith. Um, so this is, you know, we it justifies us before God, and this is the difference between, um, you know, as it's as the confessors beautifully do here, the the difference between the contrition of of Judas. Uh, is carried on the one hand and Peter on the other, or of Saul on the one hand, or David on the other, or even you could, they don't have it here, but uh, in Hebrews it talks about Esau, who, uh, though he, uh, he, he had contrition, though he sought, he didn't find a place for repentance, though he sought it with tears, it says. So the point is, is that 
you know, the, the tears are not what, the, t- the sorrow is not enough. Contrition by itself doesn't justify. Uh, it must be mixed with faith. And that's the case with Peter, who not only had contrition uh, because of his denial of Jesus uh, on the night of his betrayal, but then also had the faith that was mixed with it. Uh, and King David as well, who um, had contrition over his many sins uh, that he committed uh, in the Old Testament, and yet uh, faith was mixed with it when he heard the word of the Lord from uh, the prophet Nathan that was uh, sent to him to um, to do those two things, to condemn his sin and then to absolve him. And so that's Excellent. the comfort of the gospel. That's the gospel in the narrow sense, the absolution of sins, the removal of the guilt, and the removal of death and condemnation itself. So pa- Pastor Ramirez, we just talked about how, you know, this, the Roman Catholic says, you know, contrition merits the, the forgiveness and so forth. They, they do exactly what Pastor Creeby, you know, just said not to do, that is, you know, pair their salvation on their contrition. Is that, right. is that also then related to, like, the revivalism and, and so forth, we see more in American circles that kind of uh, that kind of mourners bench or those kind of things. Is that kind of related to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think so. I, I think if if you're asking the question uh, concerning, you know, the the if if I make a show or if I am sorry enough, then then that counts towards kind of you know. Uh, wiping my slate clean or, you know, balancing it out. I mean, we should feel sorry, sorrow for our sins, but it's not that that sorrow is in some way atoning or propitiating, um, you, you know, a, a propitiation for our, for our sin. Um, but rather we should just take it as that's the proper response to the Word of God that He declares to us concerning sin, kind of going back to the wrath of God when when God says rightly and justly in his wrath, you are a sinner. You have not um, done what you ought to do. You are not who you ought to be. And you deserve temporal and eternal punishment, as we say in the Confession of Sins on Sunday uh, every week. This is what you deserve. We should rightfully feel bad. We should rightfully feel sorrowful over those things. But it, it's a very prideful, very arrogant thing to say, well, my sorrow and my, you know, curving in upon myself and looking at about how bad I feel, that's what, that's what um, it, you know, atones for my sin, or that's why God is going to forgive me because I feel so bad over it. That's a, just a slipping right back into works righteousness. And whether that happens because of the, uh, the Roman system or tent revivalism or anyone who's trying to make a big show about it, um, and well, this, that this would fit in with the, the mindset of, of the focus on what God's word is telling us uh, what we ought to believe. This this kind of fits mm-hmm. in with with people that would say like you know if you're truly sorry for your sins then God forgives you, right? Yeah, I mean I I I uh, I mean you were talking about us clarifying. I guess I I I say I really don't have a problem with that phrase, depending on what you mean. Right. Well, I mean, I mean, it, I mean it with, without true. faith, if I mean, you're not truly you, sorry. I mean, what's the opposite of truly sorry? You're not really sorry, and if you're not really sorry for your sins, then you don't have contrition. Yeah, exactly. Then, then you really aren't contrite. You're not sorry. Hmm. So, I have no problem with someone saying if they say, "Hey, you have to be truly sorry for your sins." If by that they mean you must really be re- repentant, you must actually be contrite. Then, sure, that's fine. That's a true statement. But I think what, what, what sometimes people react about is if you're truly sorrow sorry you're gonna you know you're, you're gonna uh, you're, you're gonna beat yourself up for x number of days or you're gonna do mm-hmm. this or you're gonna do that and then there's these kind of like outward tests of it and that right. gets problematic but this but the statement on its face i don't think is problematic we are to have true repentance i mean the the catechism speaks that way the confession speaks that way so. true Indeed. Could I could I say one more thing? Uh, sure. After Sheer on this, not it's not directly related to what we just read, but it does have to do with contrition. Uh, and I think sometimes um, now this relates to what Jesus says in the gospel, and we're in Holy Week now, so this is a good time for this. Also, Jesus would not have us feel bad for him, and 
and I think that's important for us to remember. He, he, he even says this, he says this to the, to the women of Jerusalem. He says, don't weep for me. He says, weep for yourselves and for your children. Which, in other words, he's saying, you don't you know, feel bad for your sins and feel bad for the sins of your children. So we should, as Pastor Ramirez alluded to, we should feel bad for our sins. That's what contrition is. Um, and then, but we don't, but we don't leave it there, uh, because the 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 crucifixion of Jesus, the Good Friday, is actually a joyful day. It's not a sad day in the sense that we're sad that this is happening to Jesus. That's that's the wrong, uh, that's the wrong contrition. <laughs> the contrition is over our sins, our and our faith looks toward Jesus on the cross, and uh, it's thankful and joyous because of that gospel. Indeed. Indeed. Well, all right. So uh, I know Pastor Grieve covered this really well with uh, Judas and Saul and then Peter and David. Pastor Ramirez, is, is there anything else you'd like to add to those kind of distinctions between those those four biblical characters, so to speak? No, I think Pastor Grieve did a great job. Um, the I guess the only thing I would highlight is... Um, Sometimes in Bible study, I've, I've experienced this before, and I remember thinking this my, myself at, at times, um, thinking, boy, uh, it does seem like Judas is sorry, or it does seem like Saul is sorry. Why isn't he forgiven, or why isn't he, uh, you know, why does this not, quote-unquote, count for real contrition? And then, of course, I, we don't have time to do it right now with those particular stories, but um, but I find it very helpful in Bible class to say, no, here's the evidence, and here's why we should look at Judas or Saul and say, yeah, they were, they were contrite in a certain sense, but it wasn't true contrition. This was out of fear of either punishment or personal reasons of why they, they felt like, I mean, they knew that they did wrong, but they weren't truly repentant in the sense that either they thought they're their works would atone for themselves. They don't actually go to the people they should be asking forgiveness from. And uh, again, I, I don't want to get into all the details, but at the end of the day, they're arrogant. They're mm. arrogant. They are arrogant people who refuse to acknowledge the depth of their sin. And, and because they don't acknowledge the depth of their sin, they don't look for forgiveness in the right place. And they don't see that they need total, pure, and unadulterated forgiveness as the gospel proclaims and they're arrogant stubborn idolaters in that way it's not like oh well they feel sorry but they just don't believe it's like no no they don't truly feel sorry they don't truly repent of their sin and they're idolaters they they are they are stuck on themselves and they're wrapped up and curved in on themselves and we should see it for what it is they they refuse to to hear the word of god and to believe it and to confess and and to have faith in Christ. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, we just say here along with the confessions that their contrition is useless because faith is not added. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, they have they have they have no faith, and so their contrition is useless. And and then their useless contrition is is then evident in the works. Yep. In the good in the fruit of their useless contrition, which is how they then conduct their lives after that. Exactly. Like like what Jesus says, you'll know a tree by its fruit. That doesn't mean that Christians are going to act perfectly, but it does mean that good fruit will will flow from faith and and you see nothing but bad fruit that flows from unbelief from those two individuals. I mean, they both uh commit the sin of suicide and they they both uh, fall into great shame and vice, as the as the small catechism says. Exactly. All right, let's move on to paragraphs 37 and 38, uh, the relationship between faith and love, then. Uh, love is not present before reconciliation has been made through faith. For without Christ, the law is not performed according to Romans 5, 2. Through Christ, we have also obtained access to God. This faith grows gradually and throughout the entire life, struggles with sin in order to overcome sin and death. Love follows faith, as we have said before. So childlike fear can be clearly defined as anxiety that has been connected with faith, that is, where faith comforts and sustains the anxious heart. It is slavish fear when faith does not sustain the anxious heart. 
All right. Pastor Grevy, if you would just briefly summarize uh, the Roman Catholic thing here. Why why are we getting back into love and making a distinction between love and faith? Uh, the Roman Catholics teach something like that salvation is actually faith plus love, correct? Correct, and that uh, and that love actually you know brings about faith. You know we have we begin. It's the it's the preparation. The preparation is beginning with love. And that is present, love for God. Uh, but as the confessors made the point earlier, back in paragraph 34, how will people love God in true terrors when they feel God's horrible wrath, which is beyond words? So this love of God is only possible because of faith. So faith is the uh, faith is the 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 uh, how do I want to say that? Faith is the cause of love, uh, as we would say, love follows faith. So it's, that's, where, that's where childlike fear then comes in, that we can have a clear definition of it, that it does have anxiety, but it's connected with faith. And this is where the comfort is. So um, it's, not, um, it's not love first, then faith, or even, uh, or even really, or even love and faith at the same time. If you want to say it that way, but it's faith first, and then love follows it, and that's both in regards to love for God, as well as love to the neighbor. Taking the as we look at the first and second tables of the law, it's love for God under the first three commandments, and then it's also love for the neighbor under commandments four through ten, which of course then the, and of course the ten commandments uh, determine what good works truly are as well, because those are they're, they're not self-chosen works then, but they're good works that are connected to our vocations, and uh, that was mentioned earlier too, and tied directly in with God's Ten Commandments for the Christian. Yeah, Pastor Ramirez, from those commandments, then I mean, it says here, you know, for without Christ, the law is not performed. Right. How do how do we address that when people say, you know, I mean, Jesus ran into this with the Pharisees. They're like, well, we haven't murdered anyone, you know, we haven't committed adultery, and of course, Jesus sharpens the law for them. But what is it saying here? Without Christ, the law is not performed. Um, I I'm not exactly sure on what angle you're. you're it, what, what about the Pharisees now? I'm sorry. Well, just just the idea that you know you'll run into people sometimes. They'll be like, well, I haven't broken this commandment. Or oh, I, haven't I broken see that commandment. I, right. But but in the in the truth here, we confess that without Christ, the law is not performed. So no, you actually aren't keeping that commandment without Christ. Right. Ex- exactly. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, the, the the scriptures teach very very clearly, as it teaches right here in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, that. Um, only, as it says, a- after reconciliation is love present. Well, it's stated in the negative. Love is not present before reconciliation. And here reconciliation is being referred to as as what we call subjective justification. You know, Christ died for all mankind, universal objective justification, payment for sin, uh, atonement. But, um, y- you know, in the individual person, they cannot truly love until they have been enlightened called by the gospel and brought to true faith and only then can a person actually do truly good works and even then they're still marred by sin because we still have our old adam and our sinful flesh clinging to us even though we are uh christians um but yeah the the only way that true good works are done and 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 the law is full is the law is uh, you know good works uh, 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 and uh, are, are performed according to the law. That's only when we are in Christ, and um, they are only accepted for Christ's sake. So yeah. So I mean, again, we, to, back to your point about the Pharisees um, and and people who say, "Hey, well, I don't murder." Sure, maybe you don't outwardly murder or stab somebody or shoot somebody, but you murder your brother in your heart. You hate him in your heart. Uh, you know, sure, maybe you didn't go up on the witness stand and say something wrong, but you gossiped or you're slandered. Maybe you didn't literally, outwardly commit adultery, but um, your eye wandered and you had lustful thoughts. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're all guilty of breaking the law in these ways, even if we have not uh, had a, what, they, what the Scriptures call a gross outburst of sin. So, yeah. Excellent. 
Excellent. You see here also then it talks about this faith grows gradually and throughout the entire life struggles with sin. The idea that this is the, this is the Christian life, there's, there's growth. This does happen. Yeah. The Holy Spirit does work through the Word to do these things. So you have been listening to Concord Matters here on KFUO AM Radio. Uh, we're coming to the end of our show. Uh, we've been talking about repentance. That is the two parts of it, contrition and faith. And, of course, we also then would allow for a third part, if you must, that is fruits of repentance and so forth, the good works that come forth from that faith that is love and so forth, as we just finished up here talking about how love follows faith, works of love, that is those things done according to the commandments and so forth. So you've been listening to Concord Matters, uh, where you're hearing all about these good Lutheran beliefs that we have that has nothing more than what the scriptures teach and what God has handed down to his people, that we as Christians would believe these things, teach these things, and confess these things, that is, say the same thing as God which is exactly what our confessions do over and over and over again. It is Holy Week this week. Please take the time to go visit your parish this week. Uh, confess your sins or hear the absolution. Receive the Lord's Supper if you are a member in good standing. Uh, all those good things uh, that are coming this week with Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and then, of course, the resurrection of our Lord on Easter Sunday. Uh, be a part of that and uh, go hear the good news because that's what God has in store for you because of Christ Jesus. You've been listening to Concord Matters. I want to thank both of my guests, and thank you for listening. We'll be back next week.